Finally, we have uh, the, the term uh, for FreeBSD uh, developers or committers. These, these are the developers who have uh, direct access to the FreeBSD source uh, repository and can make changes directly to the tree. Uh, the, the developers, the, the committers, are the, um, are the, 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 the gatekeepers. They're not the people necessarily working on everything, but they are the people who will commit things in and will basically, when a change is committed, be responsible for that this change works. So generally, it's uh, meant that the committers and commit uh, patches are supposed to have revenue. Um, uh, the political oh, so, uh, organization of free publicity project is that there's a core team which is elect elected every two years. Uh, they're elected by the committers um, and they are basically the ones that if there are conflicts that cannot be resolved uh, by the committers themselves, uh, the core team are the ones that uh, have the power, so to speak, to go in and say, well, first they try to solve, but they um, they can they are the ones that may finally say, okay, we are going to do this. Um, yeah. uh, there are also some other teams, but I'll you know, mention them as uh, as needed later. So <coughs> the way that the, the free project has decided to organize uh, security handling is that there's one person responsible for it. Um, that's the uh, free business security officer. <coughs> it's uh, currently called the uh, festival. Um, the way it works is that the, the security officer, uh, when the team or in theory, he doesn't want to have the position anymore, generally nominates a new uh, person uh, to take over. Uh, uh, this person then nominated to the core team, and the core team who has the approval to say, okay, we um, we will say we allow this person to be the security officer. Because the security officer function will basically have delegated some of the authority uh, by the core team. Uh, I'll come into the exact details a bit later, but basically the security officer is the one that has final say in security matters. And of course the security officer is responsible to call to the call team. So in theory a uh, security officer could be replaced if the uh, security officer does something uh and controversial, but that hasn't happened, so I'm not expecting for. Um, so even though we have one security officer, uh, that's way too much work for one person to do. So we have a hierarchy structure where uh, we have uh, supporting the free business security officer, we have a, what's called security officer team. Basically, it's the, uh, this free, the security officer team, which also includes the security officer, uh, are the ones who are able to uh, send out the uh, security uh, advisories uh, and were able to actually approve commits to the uh, release branch, as mentioned before. Um, they said, basically the authority to do all the things are delegated to the security officer, and the security officer then delegates <coughs> his responsible responsibilities on to other people. Or, um, so this is not a, there's no big document saying uh, the security officer's team and then the security team are allowed to do exactly this and this. It's generally handled by common sense and, well, if somebody does something they shouldn't, well, at first they will be, respond, uh, they will be responsible for, to the FreeBSD security officer. But generally, people who are uh, well, the end is probably not. People who help out uh, know uh, what's okay and what's not, and know when to ask when uh, they're in doubt. If if they are allowed to override some normal procedure in the free business project, um, yeah. And then supporting the security officer and security officer team, we have the security team, 
which is in the context where most of the work, the security work of the project is done. Um, when for almost all security issues regarding uh, the base system mainly, uh, they will be dealt with uh, in the security team. So, uh, the, the <clears throat> even though the, um, we have one proposal, we have it's, the, the way they normally work when we get an incident that somebody says, okay, I, I'll handle this particular issue and then the rest of the security team helps out as, uh, as needed. Um, or more often, somebody needs to hook people and say, couldn't you do this? Uh, we need to have this issue dealt with. Uh, of course, it's how much crowding is needed is very much varies about is it's a serious issue. We are basically dealing with some very serious issues which get dealt with right away. And we have some issues which are, well, they're not that serious, so they take a bit longer and more running to, uh, to get done. Yeah, so I'll just, currently the security officer team is just me, uh, Samuel, and uh, Robert Watson. Uh, normally, the uh, old security officer is also part of this team if he has time. Uh, a few months ago, uh, the old security officer, Shaka, didn't step down because he simply didn't have time to help out anymore. Uh, and then for the security team, we have, I'll just say, uh, Marcus, Remco, George, Philip, Christian, and uh, Doug Elling, who, um, who help out uh, in various areas. Uh, yeah. So I spoke a bit about this, that the, the authority is basically uh, that the old security officer suggests a new one, uh, and then the the core team approves this new one. Uh, normally, this process of approving the new is well, it's, it, the, the security officer in the past has been sitting in a couple of years, so it's not like the, this happens very often. But the, generally, the, the, the new security officer su suggested by the old one is the one that's appointed. Um, then, the, well, technically, the, the the document describing the authority of the security officer, which I'll show next, some parts of it a bit, says that the security officer vets the security officer uh, uh, security team. In practice, the way it works is when the security officer changes, is that the security officer, well, the, the old security officer will only have to be part of the security team, and the old security officer team just keeps on uh, working. But whenever I People, we, more people are needed to help out. It will happen by uh, generally that the security officer <laughs> sends out an email to the internal committers list asking, uh, "Well, we need more help. Who's interested in helping out?" And then it's five minutes up to the security officer to decide, "Okay, who will we actually trust with those responsibilities?" Because we're the, all members of security security team will be dealing with uh, confidential information. We'll be giving um, information about security vulnerability ahead of time before they are published. So you need to know to be able to trust these people that they also don't uh, go leak this information to other people. I don't think it's ever been a problem that anybody has intentionally leaked any information, but uh, it, it could happen very quickly. Of course, it's a pool uh, that the security the team members are, are the winners, they are generally considered trusted already, so hopefully it should never be a problem. So, uh, to decide which authority, the, or to formalize the authority of the security officer, uh, there's a chart that <coughs> uh, uh, which have to take the important point up here. Um, basically, the most important part of the security officer and thereby the entire security team is to keep the FreeBSD users uh, informed about uh, security issues. This is uh, done for the base system through security advisors and also um, through for the port connection through uh, what we call the UX model uh, and I'll talk about this later. Uh, the next part is that the security um, 
officer and team uh, are acting as the point of contact for all the external uh, organizations which uh, deal with security. The main ones here are, uh, for instance, the US CERT uh, security response team and the similar teams around the world. Um, when they, basically, when one of these teams have pre uh, pre notifications that's not happened about some upcoming security uh, vulnerabilities, well, of course, security vulnerabilities there, it's just not announced yet, will uh, contact the security officer who will then um, decide how the FreeBSD project is going to deal with this. Uh, and finally, uh, it's the responsibility of the security officer and the team to monitor all the public channels about uh, reports of security vulnerability against uh, FreeBSD. Um, this last one can be quite a lot of work, but I'll talk about this more. Yeah, I'm the side shot this security works. So, how does the, the FreeBSD security uh, team actually deal with a specific incident? Well, of course, the first thing that is we have to find out about how it is uh, that the issue exists. And I'll talk about it in a minute about how we find out about the issues. <coughs> but the very first thing that happens when the yeah, issue, new issue comes in is that we evaluate how important this is. Of course, it's very clear that a remote code execution bind uh, is very important. An obscure bug in some local utility like Keyship or whatever kind of local utilities we have, which are very unlikely to really affect very many people, if any, um, are given a lot lower um, priority. Uh, because, of course, it would be nice if we were able to handle all uh, security um, issues right away, but uh, the FreeBSD project is uh, volunteer, and we have it, most of the work is done in spare time with people. Um, so, uh, can't drop uh, everything in our hands every time we do uh, issues reported. So, uh, one, one of the first things that happens if this is a severe security issue that uh, the FreeBSD administrators team is, uh, are involved. That's the, the people who maintain the, all the FreeBSD.org systems. All the system running the FreeBSD project, CVS servers, mail servers, web servers. And this is, well, currently this is sort of gone rather informally because I'm also part of the administrative team, so I generally know if this is something that will affect our system or not. But um, some of the FreeBSD.org systems have been set up 10, 15 years ago and have been upgraded since, and are rather interesting in their configuration, so sometimes more people of working from the administrative team are also building. So, of course, even though for the members of the FreeBSD security team is composed of people who know of different areas of, um, of, the, of FreeBSD, some kernel hackers, some port developers, and some, well, general the, uh, hackers, hackers in the co-op. Sense, not necessarily in the breaking system sense. Uh, but since this very often uh, we have, it's likely that we have uh, an issue which is, this is uh, especially in case of kernel bugs, where we don't, we don't, uh, the security team know enough how to fix this or how to fully evaluate it, then uh, we'll pull in uh, people who know about these uh, things, the, the, the communities of developers who are working on these uh, parts only and uh, help, have them help out with both evaluating and uh, fixing uh, the bugs. Of course, this also means that we have to bring in uh, more people uh, who know about uh, perhaps uh, an issue which is not published yet, but, uh, well, it had, generally it's, this is not a problem, but we try to minimize the number of people who know the details of an issue until it's uh, published and as much as possible. 
while the Freemason Project generally believe that all blocks should be fully owned, we really prefer to have a bit of time before uh, issues are published um, if, uh, so that we are able to fix them. So we have most issues which are reported to us um, we, for the base system will have a bit of time to actually uh, deal with this before the, the issue goes public. Yeah, uh, of course, then the uh, bug fix has, uh, patch has to be created. Sometimes we'll get it if it, the, the report came from someone who already made the patch, but in any case, the patch will always be reviewed for seeing does, is this act, does this actually fix the problem. Uh, much more often than one should expect, we get patches which, well, they seem not right, but when you look closer, it turns out they actually don't fully fix the problems. Um, and since that will mean that other people are, uh, well, the main important thing is means that this is not fixed for you. <coughs> and also for the security team means that once when people find out later that, oh, there was a bug in the bug fix, we have to issue a new security advisor, which means also more work, so that's why we try to get it right the first time. That's also, you, several times in part we'll see that, well, the Freebity uh, project might have been a bit slower getting out of our advisories, but on the other hand, then all the other uh, <coughs> vendors that we are coordinating would have to make a second advisory because we found a bug in the bug fix. Um, so, next, we have we started getting the where we actually release uh, the, the bug fix to the public. Uh, since the previous the uh, tree or is very large part of the time uh, involved in some kind of uh, release. At least it feels like that. Uh, people seem to extra happy reporting security vulnerabilities when there is a release. Uh, so we need to coordinate with the people organizing the release, which is the previous team releasing the name team and the frequently port managers team. Generally, they, they are very, uh, they are very open for us coming in and uh, breaking all the rules and saying we commit this now even though everybody else is not allowed to. But we coordinate them so, so that we try to cause them as little problems as possible. But we have managed to delay quite several previous releases since there was just a security bug and that needs to be fixed. Especially for on the port front, it's when we have serious security issues just before release, it can cause a lot of pain because they suddenly have to recompile X thousand frequency packages right before release. <coughs> so then we need to uh, prepare for a security advisory. Um, the frequency project tries not to make very detailed security advisories because um, many security advisories. Well, in practice, they won't affect uh, that many users. Uh, and, uh, for instance, kernel box will require you to reboot your systems. So, that is at least some inconvenience. So, we try very hard to make the advisories as detailed as possible so that people are able to evaluate does this uh, problem affect my system? Because there's no reason uh, why. Administrators should uh, have to reboot the system if this is not a box that affects their, uh, their system at all. Um, of course, part of the writing a detailed advisory is also so that we are making sure that we understand exactly what the issue is with, with regards to evaluating the patch. Yeah, and then uh, when it's going to be released, sometimes this. We have box, some boxes are FreeBSD specific, but, but more often than not, uh, the code is shared either with the other BSDs or perhaps it's, uh, it's code that's shared with all the uh, many of the open source projects. Uh, with the Linux distributions, we have a lot of coordination with because most useland tools, or well, not most, many useland tools are common. So uh, if they have a bug in the systems, we have it. And uh, since they also like to get their advisors out uh, as soon as possible after something is, pub is made public, we try to coordinate so that uh, issues are released at the same time. Yeah, and then the final part of the security 
handling security issues, of course, committing the fix to the FreeBSD source repository, and uh, sending out the security advisor. There's actually one more part because for the last couple of years we have a system called FreeBSD Update which does binary updates. So uh, that requires uh, recompiling, uh, have, having uh, the patches compiled in advance. Uh, so generally before release, the, the patches are made ready for the FreeBSD Update system so that more or less when we send, uh, when we send out the security patches, we can push the button and say these patches are now available through the FreeBSD Updates uh, system. General policy, or is it a, a per issue decision whether um, you send out an advisory for fixes are available? Uh, well, we always uh, send it out with patches. Um, generally, if generally then we find a patch rather fast or get them in, in advance, um, but if we have an issue where we want to inform people about this is actually Generally, this could happen if it's some, some issue we're not informed in advance and people are wondering what does it affect through this deal. The way we normally handle this is simply by uh, speaking up in the public forums, the through uh, security mailing list, through this deal security. Um, we don't send out for uh, the base system advisors without patches. I think historically we've done that only once, but we didn't have a patch in this whole time. Okay, that was before my time. So yes, that was like 95. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so what kind of, how are we informed about security issues? Um, the main public uh, ways to get us uh, through the security uh, mailing list, dark track uh, being the Bug track full disclosure being the main ones. Um, bug track is rather readable to monitor. Full disclosure is more interesting considering the number of 13 year olds who like to brag about whatever they like to brag about. Uh, it has a lot of noise. Unfortunately, from time to time, there's also some issues being reported there which are not reported elsewhere, at least until later, so we have to uh, keep an eye on it as well. Uh, then we have uh, uh, security companies. Uh, there, for here yeah, I mentioned Securium, which is a Danish company, but there are many others that sort of uh, moni they monitor all the public um, list and uh, mail sent out from various uh, projects. They then uh, re -send, send out their own advisories. Um, this can help us to monitor more um, more sources that we know otherwise uh, would would be able to. So basically, we use this as sort of an information uh, for finding out about issues. We have on numerous occasions disagreed uh, with them about how serious an issue is, but it's a good way to find out about, uh, about issues. Um, then we have the uh, FreeBSD uh, specific uh, list, uh, the FreeBSD mailing list. Uh, mainly the FreeBSD security uh, main list. It's not often that new issues are reported there, but it happens. And then of course we have the FreeBSD uh, much uh, disloved bug tracking system, MATS, um, which also gets uh, reports about security issues from time to time. Then uh, we have the direct uh, reports of issues to the security team on our private list. Uh, <coughs> SEC team, which is the entire security team. Then we have the security officer alias for when somebody wants to be even more restricted about who sees the issue initially. Um, for when, when sending a mail to the free business uh, officer, um, mail alias, people can also G, uh, PDP encrypt it, so that's also used to time um, while most of the FreeBSD projects, where we try to make uh, the decisions and uh, workings uh, in public, but for issues like this, the, at least we need to be able to work in private in advance. 
So that's why these uh, mail it is mailing list uh, are closed. Uh, finally, as mentioned before, we get uh, reports from uh, various uh, vendors, uh, uh, and well, well, most specific that we get reports from uh, Linux distribution PSDs, um, and uh, also uh, from, as mentioned, uh, US uh, CERN. Uh, for instance, US CERN and the other security responsibility normally deals with the larger, the issues affecting very known application. Apache binds uh, some of the, the projects where we'll often get a notification about security issues through the uh, Flint and CERN. Um, or the coordination tools. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering, what is the ratio of internally generated bug reports as opposed to the one we find out from outside? Now that we're using tools like uh, uh, Coverity and stuff like that, are the number of, of internally generated security issues, or internally discovered security issues, is that increasing relative to the external ones? It was for a while. I think it was uh, when the first the Freebity project first started using Coverity to analyze the source, a number of issues was found, which sort of had where we had to send out security issues, but it's not that many generally are found internally by tools like that. Uh, the most are reported uh, externally. Um, the, most of the most of the security issues found by these uh, tools are the the, the basic uh, buffer overruns. And for instance, for the kernel, that that has been not that many of those kind of issues. Um, we have for various user land tools, but well, Freebity hasn't in itself full uh, done full coverage runs on these things, and also the it's old obscure code, so well, not all. It's, that's all we're fine. Yeah. Um, I wonder um, what what will the average uh, uh, time that you spend on on dealing with situation, uh, especially the, the difference between internal bound uh, issues and what's reported by vendors, because uh, like when I was security officer, it was like uh, it's, it's crazy, especially when when other vendors were involved. <coughs> It's, it really differs a lot. Um, we have we have issues where we get we have a couple of patient got issues which had to be uh, coordinated through with basic basically every operating system out there, um, which includes uh, uh, companies like Cisco and Microsoft. Those could drag out for quite a long while, but generally uh, issues. Uh, by by for the service, so, uh, I think it's often about a month or something that that's uh, the time between uh, we get informed about and the, the public disclosure. But it, it varies a lot. We have had a few issues with developers uh, search, which went to the patch it, but which I think it was three days from the initial uh, inform inform to the public disclosure, but. It's there. It varies a couple of weeks uh, for the internal uh, bug reports. Basically, as fast as we can. Some issues, well, you can make a patch in a half an hour, and then you're done. Uh, other issues, uh, like for instance, the first security uh, vulnerability for this year about the JLAS D script. I think it took about two or three weeks to make the proper patch. Um, so there's no no firm rule at all. Um, finally, the, the actual coordination with all the uh, operating system vendors is often done on the main is called uh, vendor sync, which is um, has uh, I'm actually not sure exactly which of the PSDs on it, but previous years several of the commercial uh, Unix are uh, I can't remember anymore exactly who, but um, and then uh, all, most of the major uh, Linux distributions are there. When issues like, like uh, issues reported uh, through CERT, the uh, issues reported through VendorSec, which has some um, some dates which limits when we are going to um, publish this information. Well, even if we want to publish faster, we, we won't do that. We have to honor the 
what whoever submitted the original uh, report uh, says we're going to public, go public with this, because otherwise people will stop sending us a well, well, we can't, uh, can't participate in this anymore. So that's why it's, it's important for us to uh, honor uh, their wishes, even though sometimes uh, we have, as a, the, where we had <coughs> security issues, which we thought should be published much before they were. Is, is that a fixed time period, or is that the person who's submitting the... It's a person who submits it. Uh, basically, well, the original post often says, I'm going to uh, go public with this and this and this date, and then for it, if it's a complicated fix or whatever, sometimes the other vendors uh, ask, can we wait a bit or can we move this? Sometimes also, can this seems pretty trivial, can we do this uh, faster? Uh, but most cases, it's the original uh, person submitted. Should be mentioned that Ventusing is also used for um, action regular patches and being here. If we have questions saying, well, this looks odd, we think we found this uh, uh, this bug in this patch, but we have seen now four windows uh, uh, have published security patches. Have, are we missing something? Or and then we can use the vendor say as a uh, communication tool to, uh, to help uh, verify if we're wrong or uh, was actually a bug in the patch. So, um, the FreeBSD uh, security team is actually not uh, the only part of FreeBSD which guarantees any kind of support. Um, for releases, for what we call normal releases, we guarantee that we'll support the release uh, one year from the date it was released. Um, and for what we call have uh, some releases which get uh, what we call extended support than uh, two years. Basically, we would like to, it would be nice if we're able to say, well, we support all three Mr. releases for two years or perhaps even more. But FreeBSD does quite a lot of releases, so we end up having to support many different versions of FreeBSD. And sometimes that means that we have to adjust a patch for five, six, uh, or something that versions of FreeBSD. Often you can just use the same patch for all of them, sometimes you can't. So we, we try to do this as a compromise. Um, basically we say that the last uh, version of every uh, major branch will get extended support. So the current, that's currently FreeBSD 5.5, there won't be any more FreeBSD 5 releases. Um, actually I can't even remember if 6.2 is extended or normal, but the, the, well, every, we'll generally do for the releases we did not the final crash, we'll do every second release as extended support. So that's why you actually sometimes see that uh, free, for instance, FreeBSD uh, uh, 5.4 expired before FreeBSD 5.3. But that's also to be able to allow people who know that we, they can't upgrade very often to say, okay, we are going to use a uh, uh, FreeBSD which has extended support because we know we're going to get security fixes for two years. Yeah, so um, part of the evaluation of uh, incoming security is that we try to classify which type, which type of vulnerability is this. This is not really as simple as it may sound because the, the opinion of how to classify them varies a lot. Um, goes from, uh, we, we basically classify it as most securities and most code execution. That could be some kind of error, for instance, in bind, which means that you just send the packet to bind and you run whatever code you want. These are, of course, very serious um, issues and what uh, the highest priority for us. Uh, the second, uh, what's called promote them out of service, that from without access to the local machine, you're able to uh, somehow deny service. This can be in various ways. It could be that you crash the daemon, so it's just not running at all. It could also be that you tie up all system resources, so that it's not able, the system is not able to respond. <coughs> um, next part is in the for called local privilege escalation. If you already have login uh, on the system, 
Uh, the most common one would be okay, this type of vulnerability allows you to get the root, uh, root access. Of course, the definition of local, well, what is exactly local? Sometimes you might have some, some program, uh, task, for instance, running that's actually being run, for instance, by a web server, or being run on incoming email, or even better, an antivirus scanner. Um, which, well, then, the, in theory, the people don't actually directly talk to this program, but uh, it's automatically run on incoming uh, data. So, is it remote, is it local? Well, yeah. we, we generally say, say it's local if it's something that would normally require uh, local access. But we, uh, we still, um, this is also, we, we do security devices for the, these local privileges is good. The last uh, type of vulnerability is, is uh, local denial of service. If you have um, access to the system, you're able to somehow for instance, crash the system, get a problem panic. Um, we don't do security devices for these. Uh, some um, operating systems do. We have decided that it's it's well, it's it's, it's much work and it doesn't normally affect that many people. This doesn't mean that we don't make sure that the issues get fixed, but it means that we will not generally send out uh, security advices for this. Um, sometimes we might send what we call retina notices, which is what the release engineering team also uses to uh, correct critical bug fixes. Uh, but I actually can't remember if we have done that. We discussed doing this. It's a choice we made. So, uh, I'm going to go quickly through one of the privacy security environments. Um, this is one from April this year. Um, uh, yeah. First, uh, in the initial part, uh, we have the really interesting part is that the affected, uh, uh, the fix part it says this affects these these previous releases. This is a very generic way of saying, okay, this one is accepted all previous releases. They've called that entirely clear because very old didn't support IPv6, but this is basically from the supported versions. Uh, then we have a section saying the correct, when was this actually correct in the security, in, in the privacy software? Uh, this can be very useful if people want to be able to see, okay, do I actually uh, have I updated uh, uh, recently enough to have this uh, fix in? Sometimes well, there have been could be confusion at times because uh, for our stable practice, for instance, a fix might have been committed earlier. Some of the latest the fixes to bind were into the stable branches somewhat earlier than to the release branches, uh, which was then indicated there that okay, it was actually fixed uh, because it was a public issue already. It was fixed in the FreeBSD 6, running 6, uh, uh, some days before. Um, another important part is we have called CVE Day, that's a uh, uh, project from, uh, funded by the some US uh, government organization, which uh, tries to get an identifier that you need for each security vulnerability. This means that uh, you're able to find out, okay, is this, uh, if you compare two security devices, for instance, from different uh, operating system windows, are they actually talking about the same issue? Uh, that's also, uh, you're able to, if uh, you want to know more about some security issue, you're just using this CD name, you are very often able to just put it into Google or Yahoo search, whatever, and you're able to get a lot more information about this uh, vulnerability. Um, finally, we have, uh, next we have the background section, which tries to say which part of the system is this in. Uh, the basic um, uh, purpose of this is also to, in case there are two programs, uh, with the same name, so you're able to identify that, okay, if somebody else call, makes whatever a shell called bind or something like that, we want to indicate, okay, this is actually the same sort of bind, or this is whatever we're working with. So. Um, then uh, for the next week, we try to uh, differentiate between 
uh, what's actually the drug here, what's the problem, um, and uh, how does this impact people. Um, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. We try to, uh, to divide it into these two parts. Um, the impact is generally the one that's most interesting to, uh, to people reading the advisory to see, okay, does this actually impact me or my system? Uh, for instance, this one, well, if you don't run IPv6, I think it should also say that tomorrow, and you're not impacted at all. And if you have some kind of firewall, you might not be impacted at all either. So, the, of course, probably even more interesting, uh, what's the solution to this? Um, this is also the part where we um, try to, we, we, as I mentioned earlier, we try very hard to make sure we don't break things with security devices. But sometimes the security uh, it cannot be helped that we will break some kind of functionality. Do you know we will break this is saying, okay, this is very either entirely unlikely to affect anybody or the, the, the actual problem caused by this is much smaller than the security issue. So, but he will describe if we actually have to make some kind of uh, regression. Yeah, and then we have the standard we should upgrade to various the current spawn versions. Or you can also you can down uh, you can also download the patch we used for so you can patch your source tree manually if you don't use the CDSR system which um free bits of source code normally uh, distributed by this section can also, the patches can be quite long because we'll, we'll check that this patch actually works to each of the releases and sometimes we have to make a patch for each release and then we'll, the section will list the different ones. And then we try to uh, say exactly what's required to, um, to actually fix this, but to apply this. Uh, we try to uh, include the minimal amounts um, required. Uh, the minimal part we have to recompile of the system. But sometimes the interdependencies between, for instance, if the bug was in some library, uh, it might make it rather hard to uh, avoid rebuilding the entire FreeBSD with the build wall and build kernel. So generally, if this says build, suggest build walls, it's because we think we have to do it. So even though you might be using some web form, or you can just recompile this. Unless you really know what you're doing, you should do that. Yeah, because you might risk that you don't uh, fix everything. Yeah. And then the final, very fun part for us to generate is the list of exactly which files are these issues fixed with. Uh, this is done since uh, almost all files in the Fributy uh, software repository has a version identifier that you can look in the file and see which one it is. So it, by looking at this section, you can compare the version numbers with the real say, okay, is, uh, this, is this actually fixed in my local version? If you are ever in doubt. And earlier, this was actually done by hand, by guessing how CBS uh, uh, generated uh, version numbers, but now we got to type of the match script of column there. Yeah, and then finally we have references if there's further information. And as the photo indicates, all the advisories are signed by the FreeBSD security of the PTP team. As mentioned before, this is the, can remember, the, the, the security officer team. So that's um, Colin Gresswell from Watson. We have this key. So we are the ones able to, to sign and send out these uh, advisories. So that's also why we might sign it, but it might very well be something else from the security team who actually wrote the advice. <coughs> yeah, so uh, we have the previous ports collection, which you mentioned, which has an increasingly growing number of uh, ports. Um, yeah. Um, the initially, the previous project had to do this also with security devices. This didn't work out because it simply didn't scale over too many. Then tried all the previous security nodes, where it's assembled a bunch, uh, but 
that meant that there was some large delay about when this was out. So what we do now is we have a view XML, which is a XML document where we describe the security issues for ports. Um, this in this document we actually we also we don't wait until uh, an issue is fixed necessarily we might document it before it's fixed. Um, generally the way it works is that the each port has a maintainer which fixes the issue, but sometimes uh, somebody from the Tribute security team will go in and uh, fix it directly. This sort of bypasses the normal rules of how the project works and coverage, but this is then done when we judge that we, this is an important fix and we need to get it fast. And generally the maintainers don't complain about this because they know we, we try to minimize it. Yeah, I'll just skip most of it, but we have this XML document that people initially think it looks very scary, very complicated, but well, if the, the hard part is not really filling out this XML, it's actually finding all the information. This was fixed in this version, and so on and so on. So it's more large file for all the points? <clears throat> yeah, it's getting quite large, but generally it's not really a well, with It's automatically processed. So. Uh, the interesting part was, I'll well, skip it to have the bureau.org website, which is then um, where you can read uh, about the issue. And yeah, example of a specific issue. And the or an even more interesting part is that this can be caused part of magic. So we have a port or a tool which you are able to run on the system, which then uh, checks all your installed ports against this uh, file of uh, non vulnerability and change which uh, exist. Yeah, I'll skip that. So very briefly to uh, good way to keep your uh, self informed if you're running through this system. Subscribe to FreeBSD and our security list where we send out security badges. All of it can be used as a tool to check the local system. It should also be mentioned that even if all of this system has no issues, well, we might not always be entirely caught up with the VUXML entry, so don't think that this is uh, means that you're entirely safe, but we try to update as fast as we can. And of course, for the more people who want to maintain the local system has actually time to the Follow the public mailing security mailing lists. Yeah, and we'll have to skip that. Any questions? Yeah? How can I help out with the port security? <laughs> well, we, we need people uh, to have public mentioned that Remco is part of the security team, but you know, we, we need more people to help out uh, with uh, dealing with port security because, as you saw the graph, there's more and more ports and it takes a lot of time and it gets really boring. So, if anybody mm -hmm. wants to help out through this security, help out with helping out documenting security issues, of course, is a very good thing. You shouldn't say it's boring. What? You shouldn't say it's boring. Oh, <laughs> sorry, yeah. It's fun, it's interesting. It's fun. <laughs> well, when you make your hundred entries, it starts to get a bit boring, or, but that's why we need more people to, so you don't have to make that many more. You're keeping your audience from the cave. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> Let's coffee break now.